Okay, so uh, today is our last day in Ephesians. It's been a long time coming. I think we're probably 40 or 50 lessons in. Uh, I, I don't know the official count. Um, so thank you for persevering. Hopefully this, this journey through Ephesians has been worthwhile. Hopefully you've learned a lot. Today in the introduction, I'm going to um, sort of summarize what we've learned in Ephesians and then relate it to where Paul is going here in these last few verses. So, uh, Michael, recap. Uh, next week, no class. Christmas weekend, no class. And then we're having uh, Tara commandeered some board here, so we're having a brunch on the 10th. All right. Um, so, uh, where was I? So, kind of kind of do a, during the introduction of uh, a recap of, of where the journey we've been on in Ephesians and then uh, how Paul relates it to uh, his benediction and how he closes out the book. So let's, uh, let's read the passage, we'll pray, and then we'll jump in. So we're in Ephesians 6, 18 through 24. We're actually going to cover six verses today, can you believe it? Uh, the truth is we're only going to be covering one verse, we're just going to skip the other five, if that makes any sense. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right, Ephesians six eighteen. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert. With all perseverance and petition for all the saints. A lot of alls in there. If you notice in that verse, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known the boldness of the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but, to, but you also may know about my circumstances how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. Uh, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren in love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. We just want to lift your name up in this class. Lord, thank you for letting us go through Ephesians. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to just really spend a lot of time and dig into the deep truths. Lord, uh, in this class, when we walk through the Bible, we walk slowly. And Lord, it, it enables us to just mine all the rich truths that you have in your word for us, Lord. Uh, bless this class for their perseverance. Bless this class for their uh, tenacity to dive in these deep subjects, Lord, and to stay patient and stay consistent, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, today is on prayer. So we've just finished up uh, the armor of God. Last week was on the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and I related it to how you can use the word of God, and how you can apply it to yourself um, in this battle. But now uh, you can see how uh, we're going to be diving into prayer, and I don't want to take up too much of the introduction, but basically Paul has given us this great repository of information about uh, all the resources that we have in Christ who we are in Christ, and then he sort of tailors the end of it with, and you have this armor, so now you are you have all these things in chapters 1 through 3, and then 3 through 6, he also builds on that, and, and so at the end of it, you're literally like jacked, you're like, these are all the things that I have, and then what does he do right at the end? He says, but, see, we have a tendency, we have a tendency to get all these things, and we're jacked. We're jacked on Jesus. And what does that make us do, right? Kind of puffs us up in a sense. And what does Paul do right at the end? He puts us on our knees. He says, prayer, prayer. I'm going to focus you back to prayer. Today is on prayer. So Jesus urged his, his disciples always to pray and not lose heart. He knows his soldiers easily become tired. So we just finished up this idea of the armor of God. So we're soldiers. So he knows that soldiers easily become tired, weak, and discouraged when the battle gets hard. And the struggle with Satan, it is either pray or faint. It's your two options. You're either going to pray or you're going to faint. 
in a sense. There's no staying still. You're going to do one or the other. You're going to pray and move forward, or you're going to faint. Paul's closing admonition for believers is to pray at all times. And it's not accidental. Note, not only does it give final instruction about the believer's warfare, but it is the climactic truth of the entire epistle because prayer fills all of Christian life. This is something you're going to really uh, see throughout today's lesson. Uh, be in an attitude of prayer. Be constantly praying. All right? Um, if, if you have this idea that you pray on your knees before bed, you know, like a little child over your bed, or maybe you have a kneeling stand, you kneel on the stand, or you, you pray like a Muslim on a mat three or five times a day. No, that's not what we have in Christ. We are in constant communion with the Lord. It's almost like we are a network router, and we're hardwired, and we are plugged in, and we're constantly getting this data, receiving data, and given data. That's kind of how we are. Prayer is the crescendo at the end of Paul's anthem of Ephesians. No New Testament book. All right, dear one, I really want you to clue in on this next couple paragraphs because these paragraphs are going to summarize what we have been through in Ephesians, and it should really get you excited. So no New Testament book so fully delineates the resources and blessings of of the believer as does Ephesians. Throughout the book, Paul magnifies and expands the truth that he briefly mentioned in Colossians. In him, you have been made complete. So in Colossians, he says, in him, you've been made complete. In Ephesians, he shows you and demonstrates what this completeness is. And that Peter touched on in the second epistle, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We have it all, dear one. We have it all in Christ. So here's the monumental catalog of all that is ours in Jesus Christ. Get ready. Buckle up. I don't know if I should read it fast or if I should read it slow. We'll just see how, what happens here. Paul begins Ephesians with the comprehensive declaration that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He then proceeds to tell us that we are chosen predestined and adopted as God's children, lavished with his grace, redeemed and forgiven, given the mystery of his will, receivers of inheritance, have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, greatly loved by God, made alive with new life, the workmanship of Christ created by him for doing good works, given God's own peace, made one with Christ and with every other believer as his own body, made citizens of God's kingdom and members of his family. You are members of his family, dear one, built into God's own temple and the dwelling place of his spirit. We are given boldness and confident access to God, made powerful beyond our imagination, given the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, individually and uniquely gifted by Christ, blessed with specifically gifted leaders to equip us in the work of ministry, taught by Jesus Christ himself, given a new self in God, in God's holy likeness, made light, offered the fullness of the Holy Spirit, given the instructions and resources to make all relationships with others what God intends them to be, and given, and given God's full armor to make us invincible against Satan and his demonic forces. More do we need? Yeah, just, just like I said, fold your papers. It's time yeah. to go home. Yeah. Like this is all we needed this morning. Think about the amazing resources and benefits that we have in Christ. No other person, no other religion, outside of Christ, possesses these things. Now, it's what I alluded to earlier. After a believer contemplates this breath breathtaking list of blessings we possess as an exalted child of God, Paul realizes the great danger that is likely to follow. The temptation to self-satisfaction and spiritual arrogance. Hey, I've got all these things. How many times have I told you that we have this big recliner that we just recline in, right? We have this tendency to possibly do that. Spiritual arrogance. The student of Ephesians does well to take Heart Paul's warning to the Corinthians. Let him who thinks he stands 
Take heed, lest he fall. The magnificent and boundless blessings described in Ephesians are so enriching that Satan will try to use them to turn our thoughts to ourselves. So he's going to try to use these things to turn it back inward as maybe a source of pride, as the blessed ones rather than the one. So he's going to try to turn it back into us rather than us broadcast it back to the one who gives the blessings. Ephesians begins by lifting us up to the heavens and ends by pulling us down to our knees. Think about how wonderful that is. Don't think, Paul concludes, in effect, that because you have all these blessings and resources that you can now live the Christian life without further help from God. We're now not independent of him because we have all these things. It, moreover, we're even more connected to him. God's armor is neither mechanical nor magical. We cannot simply take hold of it on our own and expect it to produce supernatural feats automatically. So, like I said, we're going to dive into prayer today. So, we're just going to really cover Ephesians 6.18. Uh, the rest of it is just a benediction, so we'll just read the benediction. But with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. The four alls introduce the five, five emphases Paul makes regarding the general character of the believer's prayer, prayer life. So we have the variety of prayer, the frequency, the power of prayer, the manner, and the objects of prayer. So we're going to divide prayer up in this lesson into five different categories. So the variety of prayer. I've kind of already alluded to it. You don't just have one prayer. You know, I pray in my bed at night, kneeling over the bed, maybe like a little child. Prayer, prayer refers to general requests, while petitions refer to those that are specific. Both words point to the idea that we are to be involved in all kinds of prayer in every appropriate form. Spiritual precept and allowance suggest we may pray publicly or privately, in loud cries and soft whispers or silently, deliberately, and planned, or spontaneously, while sitting, standing, kneeling, or even lying down, at home or in church, while working or while traveling, with hands folded or with hands raised, with eyes open or closed, with head bowed or erect. Like the Old and New Testament, like the Old, the New Testament mentions many forms, circumstances, and postures for prayer, but prescribes none. Jesus prayed while standing, he prayed while sitting, he prayed while kneeling, and he prayed probably in the other positions, in, in any other position. We can pray wherever we are and in whatever situation we are in. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 eight. Paul said, for the faithful, spirit-filled Christian, every place becomes a place of prayer. And I'm going to give some examples of that coming up in my own life. The frequency of prayer. The Jewish people of Paul's day had several prescribed times for daily prayer. I just mentioned the Muslims, how they pray three times or five times a day, depending on where they're at. If they're in country, like, like in their home country, they pray five times a day. If they're out of their country, they can limit it to three times a day, depending on what's going on. And think about that. Think about how legalistic and restrictive that is. Uh, I can often remember, you know, the guy I lived with, Muhammad, uh, he would go into our bedroom because our bedroom was connected to our office. So in our living room, and our kitchen it was all in one yeah. office, living room, kitchen, and then our bedroom was off. And I can remember he would, he would go in there, you know, he'd be in there 15, 20 minutes and I knew he was praying. He'd pop back out and, and uh, we'd get back to work. No problem. I didn't have a problem with it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, me being a, Good Southern Baptist American boy. Every now and then I'd give it a good snicker, kind of like, uh, well, I'm praying right here, buddy, sitting in my chair, okay? <laughs> I'm going to pray too, and I'm going to pray against your prayers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But the point is, is we're not regimented to some, you know, regiment. But the coming of the new covenant and the birth of the church brought a new dimension to prayer as it did to everything else. Jesus said, keep on the alert at all times, praying in order 
that you may have strength to escape all things, these things that are about to take place. And he was specifically talking about, you know, his crucifixion and the, persecu perse uh, the persecution of uh, the saints at that time. But it's applicable to us today. Uh, the more we're in prayer, the more we're in a sort of an attitude of prayer, uh, I think I think it's safe to say that it will lend to, you know, saving our bacon in certain situations, you know. Among other things, the earliest Christians in Jerusalem were continually devoting themselves to prayer. In many of his letters, Paul urged his readers to regularly devote themselves to prayer. The apostle assured Timothy, his beloved son in the Lord, that he prayed for him night and day. It makes me think of my kids. I often mention to you that I, I pray daily for my children. Um, and, you know, I don't pray some uh, hokey pokey supernatural type prayer. It's simple. It's, 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 you know, I sort of think, and I don't want to say anything that would degrade Christ in any way. Uh, so don't get the wrong impression. But uh, uh, I sort of think of when I pray, Jesus is standing right next to me and he's my friend because he says he's our friend. Okay, we are a friend of Christ. So imagine your friend standing next to you. You know, Michael and I often go out and eat together, and Michael and I don't use these and thous and say we don't talk to each other that way. It's just normal speech. Michael, what's going on, buddy? That kind of thing, right? So, so it's the same way that I pray for my children. Like, Lord, draw my children to you. Draw them to your word. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that, right? It's me talking to my God my Lord, but also my friend. And night and day. To pray at all times is to live in continual God consciousness. Man, that's something. Can you imagine if we succeeded <laughs> at living in continual God consciousness? What would our relationships be like? Uh, where everything we see and experience becomes a kind of prayer, lived in deep awareness of and surrender to our Heavenly Father. When we experience something good and beautiful, we immediately thank the Lord for it. I mean, how many times have you maybe took a trip? Y'all just went on a trip to Alaska, wasn't it? You know, and you're looking out seeing dolphins and whales and mountains and snow-capped mountains and maybe icebergs or whatever is up there, and you're like, thank you, Lord, for this. This is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the whole time. I, I call it eye candy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you guys are artists, right? You're always painting, you're drawing, you're doing something like that. On the way in today, the trees were turning, and I said, oh, look at all that eye candy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, I love that. Yeah, and the Lord has basically been like an artist. This has been his canvas for He's us. He's got the best color box you ever saw. <laughs> That's right. Never matched match the color. That's right. Yeah. And I always, we always say, when we see like a sunset or something, it's perfect. Nobody, and you'll never see it again. That's yeah. perfect for what we're going to look at. Yeah. But, you know, it's never reproduced. Yeah, that one's gone, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of a kind. Yeah. That's so good. When we see evil around us, so that was the one thing. When we see beauty around us, we thank the Lord for it. But when we see evil around us, we pray that God will make it right and be willing to be used by him to that end. How many times have we said, Lord, we don't understand what happened. But Lord, use it for your glory. Use it for your purposes. We don't understand what happened. When we meet someone who does, who does not know Christ, we pray for God to draw that person to himself and to be used to be a faithful witness. Lord, somehow draw that loved one or that friend or that person that you know, somehow draw them to you. And Lord, enable me to be a witness somehow. When we encounter trouble, we turn to God as our deliverer. Oh, this is always the first thing we do. You know? When we encounter trouble, we hit our knees. In other words, our life becomes continually uh, ascending prayer, a perpetual communion uh, with our Heavenly Father. To pray at all times is to constantly set our minds on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Four examples of Glenn's remembered prayers. These are prayers that I remembered, all right? 
I'm going to start out good and I'm going to end with bad because I want to be humble. All right, I'm going to, I want to be, I, I want to seem humble, okay? Uh, if I just seem humble, if I can just seem humble, okay? All right, first one, airplane sale. Um, one time uh, I was rushed to fly back to Pennsylvania because there was some hurricane or something happening up there. Big storm and my company was afraid all the airports were going to close. So they said, get on a plane. Literally laying in bed at probably 9 a.m. Okay, boss, I get on a plane. I roll over and Tara, Tara, I got to leave right now. Really? But, yep. I get on my computer, find a flight. They only had one ticket left for me to get out that day. First class. I'm like, this is great. I'll do it, you know. So I get in there. I'm sitting in the first class. I never got to fly first class. This time I did. And so I'm sitting there and... Uh, we wore these pants in the oil field. They're called FR jeans, uh, fire retardant pants. And it's like, I think Wrangler was the only people that made decent ones. And every single oil field person bought the same pair of pants. Like it wasn't, it wasn't that we, you know, it was just like a lack of choice. Twin. Yeah. So I'm sitting down in first class and all of a sudden this man, probably 55 years old, you know, starts uh, I'm sitting by the window, and he, he kind of sits down next to me in the first class, and I notice the FR pants on. And I said, uh, uh, what do you do? He said, uh, well, I'm in the oil field. I went, I went, I'm so ridiculous sometimes. Yeah, this is just a few indications here. I went, I know that you're, uh, you're wearing FR pants. I just sort of said it sarcastic. I, I realized that you're wearing FR pants. He was like, oh, oh. I said, no, oh, what do you do in the oil field? He said, oh, well, I'm over all of drilling uh, for the Northeast for this particular company. And I went, really? He said, yeah. I went, I just drilled a well for you, but it wasn't for you. And so what these companies would do is it would be like company A and company B would like put a little money in on this well to help them out. They're like a 10% owner. And any time they did that, all the data from these wells would have to be sent. Hey, Karen, welcome. All the data from these wells would have to be sent to the partner that put the 10% in. Well, he was one of the partners. And, and, uh, and I said, uh, he said, uh, you did? I said, yeah, what's your name? And he said, told me his name, John. And I was like, I sent you a bunch of emails with all our data. He was like, you did? Pulls up his, his uh, iPad, starts scrolling through. He's like, is that you? I said, yeah, that's me. And at this moment, basically, I had this standard prayer that I pray. Uh, the, next, the, next, the next point is the same prayer. Uh, I have the standard prayer that I usually pray in these situations. I always pray. I don't know how I got this. Probably when I was younger or maybe reading something about Solomon when I was a kid. I'm not sure. But I always pray, Lord, allow me to find favor with men. I'll say, allow me to find favor with man or this man or find favor in this situation. And so I, I just generally prayed that, Lord, allow me to find favor with this man. Okay? I mean, I remember praying it. So as I'm sitting there, we get to talking. And uh, he, was, he, he was like, wow. He was sort of bragging about how fast we drilled it and how good we drilled it. And I was like, yeah, man. And I said, uh, and I looked at him at one point and I said, and you don't have me on all your rigs for what reason? And uh, just like that, he controlled 25 rigs. He was the boss of 25 different drilling rigs. And uh, he said, I'll tell you why. He said, because I swore I'd never use your company again. I went, why? He said, well, y'all sent two idiots out to our rig one day. And they had, so the, the well is a hole, right? You drill a hole in the ground. Somebody literally dumped a big hunk of steel down the hole. And it ruined the hole. They had to cement the well back millions of dollars. And it was the two guys from our company accidentally kicked something in the hole. And he's like, that's it. Never using you idiots again. That was what his thought process was. And so remember, I prayed, let me find favor with this guy. And I said, look, I'll tell you what. I'm the field supervisor. I said, uh, um, I will personally, and you have to understand, he had run all the other Baker Hughes from my company salesmen away. Like, don't even come to my office. Like, I've, I'm never using your again. You're wrote off. And I said, look, I get that. I'm not a sales guy. I'm a field guy. 
he liked field guys. He's kind of like a dude, you know. And uh, I said, tell you what, let me prove the principle. Give me a three pad site, three wells. Let me show up. I said, I'll even give it to you. I didn't have the authority really to negotiate this, but I was working here. You know what I'm saying? I said, I'll work to get you a basically an at cost well. He said, how much? I said, I don't know, probably do 30, 40,000 bucks. He's like, really? I said, yes. And uh, I said, you give me a three well deal where I can prove the principle. If I can prove the principle, what will you do then? He said, uh, well, I got three rigs coming up in Ohio. I'll give you those three rigs. I said, really? He says, yeah. We shook hands, made the deal right there on the airplane. Get off the airplane, called my boss, told him what happened. They're all flabbergasted. They're like, what? Like, we've been trying for years to get this guy, and you got him on the airplane? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I literally it went all the way to the top of Baker Hughes that I sold this guy on the airplane in a two-and-a-half-hour flight, you know. And what happened? The Lord allowed me to find favor with this man. And long story short, believe it or not, in the, there's, we're still with him. I'm not there anymore, but the company is still servicing this guy. He increased our business because we did so. I went out there, we hit a home run, and I wound up getting five rigs out of it. And then after that, we wound up getting 10 rigs out of it, okay? All from that airplane sale. And estimated in the last 12 years that since I was on that airplane, five to six hundred million dollars in business from that airplane sale. And that is what, when you ask God simply, you know, you don't have to name it and claim it, Lord, zap this man in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Lord, yeah. allow me to find favor with this man, okay? So that's the airplane sale. Interview successes. This is going to seem real superficial, and it's going to seem real braggadocious. I, I really don't want you to take it that way. I, I really want you to take it in the sense that this is what you need to employ in your life, okay? Every interview that I've ever been on in my life, I went on 13 interviews to get hired at Alcon. 13 different people I had to interview with. It was a meat grinder. But, as I look back on my life, I've never interviewed for a job that I didn't get. If I interviewed for a job, I got it. And what do I always pray? Every one of those 13 people that I sat down in front of Alcon, and uh, Pat knows many of them, some of them were directors, some of them were managers, things like that. I would always pray, right as I'm walking into the room, Lord, allow me to find favor with this person. Somehow, some connection, some way that the Lord can open a door and allow me to find favor. This is how we pray. All right, signature problem. I told you I was going to end on a negative note so I could be humble. While at Alcon, I, uh, I signed a document incorrectly. Meaning, I did the work, and then I failed to sign it. Alcon's FDA-regulated place, super regulation. And I noticed it sort of the next day. Oh, I forgot to sign that. So what did I do? Pencil whipped it. Well, Alcon had a policy of people in my grade level and my position. No tolerance. You sign and backdate, you're fired. I was in my first year at Alcon when I did that. Um, you know, uh, basically it's lying on a document is what it is. Uh, so I walk into the plant and my boss, I walk into the plant at two o'clock and my boss meets me. He says, Glenn, uh, we're gonna walk up to the conference room right now. Like I'm walking in, like I'm not even at my desk yet. He says, we're walking into the conference room right now. He said, uh, whatever you do, don't lie. I looked at him and said, I'm not gonna lie, you know. Uh, he said, okay. Well, as I'm walking, I'm praying, Lord, <laughs> I'm in a bind here. I don't know, I don't even know what the bind is, but I know I'm in a bind, okay. Uh, Lord, somehow in this situation, I'm submitting myself to you. I know that you're my provider. Here's what I told a lot of guys when I was in the oil field, when I would witness to them, I'd say, here's your paycheck. Here's your paycheck. And this top box, I think, if I remember right, this is who pays it, like your company. Right? And then it's to you. And then here's the amount over here. And I would I would tell the guys in the 
do a deal. I'd say, here's the deal. All you control on that paycheck is you. God controls the company, and he controls the amount. <laughs> right? Just put your trust and your faith in him. He says he's your provider. He's going to provide. So as I'm going to this meeting that I don't even know what it's about, okay, I walk in this meeting. I have director of quality assurance, director of manufacturing. I have two managers and the HR manager in there, and obviously my boss, and then the person that found that I did that. And I'm like, wow. There's a lot of people. This does not look good for old Glennie. You know what I mean? And, I, and like I said, I'm praying, Lord, uh, my trust, my faith is in you. You're my provider. Uh, I'm going to be honest about what went on. And hopefully, they accept my honesty. They accept that I'm putting myself on the cross saying, yes, I messed up. Yes, I did that. I could be better than this. And it worked out. I remember going home to Tara sat on the couch. She had no clue what was going on. She used her home early because they gave me a little bit of time off. <laughs> I had to go home one day. Uh, and uh, she said, what are you doing? And I says, you know, I broke down. I said, honey, I almost blew it. I almost blew it. You know, our family, provision, our children, with little Madison, I think you were probably maybe pregnant with Morgan at the time, you know, and I almost blew it. I almost gave up this great job because I did something wrong. And then, when you get really down to it, last night, I told you I like to soak. And sometimes I've, I've run fence yet. I did a lot yesterday. I ran fence. I worked on my pool, did some other stuff. I was tired. So I, so I told Tara, I was like, you going to take a bath tonight? She said, no. I said, well, I want to get in there and get a good soak. Well, I turned the water on, not thinking. A little bit too hot. And uh, I hop in the tub. And I'm like, and I'm like, whoo! You know what I mean? That, that overwhelming hot feeling all over your skin. And at that moment, another prayer. It caused me to think for a moment, what would it be like to spend eternity in scalding water? You know? Just that moment of sitting in that hot, burning water that's burning my skin, it caused me to think, oh, Lord. It caused me to really come in like really just bring it home, you know, like, oh Lord, I would never want to experience this for eternity. And it causes you to repent, it causes you to bring it in. The contemplation of sin and God's wrath on the ungodly, because this could be just a fraction, maybe 1% of what hell could be like, right? So these are the prayers that I'm giving you some examples of. Examples of successes is where you pray and God works in your favor. And, and when you pray, but it also, and then also when you pray, but he also works internal. So it'd be an external versus an internal, right? So we want to, the number three, the power of prayer. Paul's most important and pervasive thought about prayer is that it should be in the spirit. We hear this all the time, pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit. This supreme qualification for prayer has nothing to do with speaking in tongues or in some other ecstatic or dramatic manner. To pray in the Spirit is to pray in the name of Christ, to pray consistent with his nature and will. And listen, I bolded and underlined this part because I wanted you to see these, this sentence because we're going to have another object example in a minute. Hopefully you will all find joy in this after the fact. Uh, don't laugh in the middle of it, please. Um, to pray in the Spirit is to pray in concert with the Spirit. Think about that. This this is the most important point I want you to understand in this paragraph. To pray in the Spirit is to pray in concert with the Spirit. And I'm going to give you all an analogy that I came up with last night on how to show you what that means. All right? Who helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes with the saints according to the will of God. As the Spirit of grace and of supplication, the Holy Spirit continually prays for us, and for us to pray rightly is to pray as he prays, to join our petitions, here's the word, to join our petitions to his and our will to his. It's like an on-ramp, like on the interstate. He's the interstate 
and you're joining the on-ramp. You're going into him. You're joining him. It is to line up our minds and, des and desires with his mind and desires, which are consistent with the will of the Father and the Son. So we're all going to sing here in a second. We're not going to sing very long, but we're going to sing. You're going to get to hear me sing. So that's what I say. Don't laugh yet. Okay. <laughs> Um, but I want to do a quick note about singing. This is another Alcon story. Pat has invigorated my mind in thinking of Alcon stories. Uh, I went to this training one time. Uh, this was would have been three or four years after the signature event. Uh, but I went to this training. It was in uh, it was in the tower, and um, Alcon had this seven story building we called the tower. And I was in the tower, so I'm in the tower doing this training, all day training. It was for something. I'm not exactly sure what it was for. And I walked in with a radio on my hip and a cell phone in my pocket. And I was over all of uh, maintenance at the Fort Worth North facility. So I had 50 mechanics that reported to me and stuff. So I was, I was nailed all day long, you know, just constantly communicating with me. Well, when I went to this training, this guy that was holding the training, uh, he was, he's a trainer, and he wanted undivided attention. He wanted you to pay attention to him, and he was kind of a pill. He was a, either a Brit or an Aussie. I can't remember which one he was, either a Brit or an Aussie. And he walked in, and he says, okay, this is the deal. You're at training. I want your undivided attention. He was real, real, real bold and direct. And at Alcon, we weren't used to that kind of stuff because everyone there was nice. You know what I mean? You had to be nice to everybody but everything. And he, and, and he said, uh, I want your undivided attention. He said, here's the deal. If your cell phone goes off or your radio goes off, he says, and I hear it and it interrupts the class, I'm going to make you, we're going to stop class. We're going to make you stand up and sing a song in front of everybody. <laughs> kind of like, you know, embarrass you, you know. And I'm like, I don't want to sing a song, you know what I mean? So I got my cell phone turned off. I got to turn off my radio. I couldn't really ever turn it off because something could have blown up in the plant and I have to be involved, you know. Uh, all of a sudden, probably about 15 minutes in, my radio goes off. This little guy says, that's it. You, sir, you've interrupted the meeting. You must stand up and sing a song. And I, I had the forethought, because I mean, I'm, I'm an alpha personality. He's an alpha personality. Come on, man, you're not intimidating me. I said, here's the deal. I said, I'll do it, sir, under one, one uh, you know, Stipulation. He said, what's that? I said that you don't interrupt me and that you allow me to sing the entire song start to finish. And he went, okay, I can do that. I said, okay. Oh my goodness. So I led the whole class in Oh, the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and the guy was lit. And all of a sudden I start singing, Oh, the blood of Jesus, you know? And next thing you know, some other people start chiming in, and it's like it's like totally defeated what the guy was trying to do. <laughs> and we're talking about you know Christ's blood making us white as snow because of his blood, you know. It turned it into a song deal there, yeah. So anyway, all right. To show you how we are in concert with the Holy Spirit, here's what I want all of y'all to do. And if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to do it. I would like some participation, but um, some participation. So, <clears throat> we're going to sing all four verses of Amazing Grace here, okay? But none of you are allowed to come in until the second verse. So, that saved a wretch like me, okay? So, you start on that saved a wretch like me. So, the idea is, is that I'm not the Holy Spirit. I want to make that clear. But I am the Holy Spirit in this example, and I'm already singing the song. <laughs> And then you are going to come in. You're going to join in. You're going to merge in with what the Holy Spirit is already doing. Okay? You ready? <laughs> I think I've rehearsed this a couple times. I'm going to sing in my deep voice. Uh, I kind of have a high voice and a deep voice. I'm going to sing in my deep voice. Okay? Uh, I think I, I think I can, I think I can maybe hold a melody better in my deep voice. All right? So, all right. <laughs> I don't have a hard time starting here. Uh, all right. Ready? <laughs> All right, everybody get ready. All right. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
is how it's done. The Holy Spirit is already singing, and you, in concert, take up the second verse. You're not making new music. You're in concert with him. That is praying in the Spirit. Now, how do we know what the music he's making is? Right here. It's in the Scripture. All right. As we learn more about Christ, as we put on Christ, as we become closer to Christ, as our line starts going higher on that graph, we will we'll know the song. We're going to know the words to the song, and we're going to be singing it with him. Okay. <laughs> now, that that, good singer. now that that is over. <laughs> okay. The manner of prayer. Whenever he prays, the believer should be on the alert with all perseverance and petition. Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray. Paul counseled the Colossians to devote themselves to prayer. The word devote means to be steadfast, constant, and persevering. To be devoted to prayer is to earnestly, courageously, and persistently bring everything in our lives before God. To pray the right manner also involves praying specifically. Specific prayers. Okay? So, so if, if you walk into your child's bedroom, or maybe you walked into one of your children's bedroom when they were young, and you heard, overheard them praying, Lord, bless all the people of the world. Right? Like, you want to go, uh, honey, uh, let's be a little more specific. Why don't you just pray that God will bless me, you know? <laughs> that kind of thing. So be specific in your prayers. To pray the right manner involves praying specifically. Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus promised, that will I do. Now, what are you going to ask in his name? We already covered it in the third step. You're in concert with him. You're praying something in his name that he's already in concert doing that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask me anything in my name i will do it he will do it ask anything in his name and he will do it remember he's like a highway and you're merging onto it you're going to ask him things in that flow in that highway god answers prayer in order to put his power on display see this is an interesting thing that our class we we drive this point home primarily because I love this point so much, is that the things that, that God is doing in us, whether it be good or bad, depending on how you look at it, all of it, everything that is being done is for what? His glory. He is glorifying himself in you and through you, in the things that are going on. And when we do not pray specifically, Okay, he cannot answer specifically, thereby clearly display his power and his love for his children. So the idea is, is you just say, Lord, bless all the people of the world. How can he really receive glory in that? You couldn't see that. But you could say, Lord, we're praying for Chad. We're praying for your husband's knee or back. We're praying, you know, for this person. Okay, or that's physical. Well, let's say we switch it to uh, spiritual. Lord praying for my pride. Lord, we're praying for more humility. Lord, we're praying for uh, being able to tame my tongue, as of last week's example. Lord, we're praying to do these things. Lord, work on me. Those are specific things. And God can demonstrate his power and his love for his children. To, pr to, to pray, as young children often do, God bless the whole world, is really not to pray at all. We must think about particular people, particular problems, and particular needs and then pray about those things specifically and earnestly so that we can see God's answer and offer him our thankful praise. Most Christians never get serious about prayer, in this the case, until a problem arises in their own life or in the life of someone they love. Then they're inclined to pray intently and specifically and persistently. What I'm imploring you to do is to don't wait for the emergency room. Don't wait for the thing. Already be in merging into that already be singing in concert with the holy spirit number five the objects of prayer elsewhere paul commands us to pray for unbelievers for government leaders and for others but here the focus is on the saints only the saints christian believers are involved in the spiritual warfare for which god provides the armor just has been describing and who can pray in the spirit so here is thought about this example last night here is me 
and here is all of you in this class. And I'm praying for you. You are who I'm praying for. I'm not even praying for myself. I'm praying for you. So what are you doing? Here's you. You're praying. And here's all the people in the class around your circle. What are you doing? You praying for them. Then here's somebody else in the class. So this is Glenn. Maybe this is Doug. Okay. And then this is Karen. One of the three. <laughs> Here's your circle of prayer. And you're praying. You can see how these prayers, as we're praying for, you don't even need to pray for yourself. Right? Trust me. As we pray for each one another, we create this prayer chain or star. I envision these all these thousands of little stars out there. And each one of us are, are one of them, and we're praying for the other. We're all gleaning off of each other's prayers. It's not inappropriate to pray for ourselves any more than it is inappropriate to pray for physical needs, but um, just as the Bible primarily calls us to pray about spiritual needs rather than physical, it primarily calls us to pray for others rather than ourselves. All right, I told you we are going to finish up a little early today. Conclusion, Paul closes the book by asking fellow believers to pray for him. As he laid out to us, he offers a, benedic a benediction in humility and offers comfort, peace, love, and grace, all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's the benediction. So pray on my behalf. He's asking, I need one of you guys to pray for me. Okay, pray for me. That utterance may be given me in the opening of my mouth. He's saying, pray for me so that I'll proclaim the gospel. To make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Here's the interesting thing. At this moment that Paul was writing this epistle, he's probably got an ankle bracelet hooked to a chain, hooked to a wall in a jail cell. He's not saying, pray for the sores that are on my ankles because the, the steel has been rubbing through my skin. No, he's praying, pray for my mouth so that I have the boldness to proclaim the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you may also know about my circumstances. So he's going to say, okay, pray for my boldness, pray for my mouth, pray for me to be able to pre preach the gospel, but since you are all concerned about my circumstances, the chain and the steel on my leg, I'm going to send Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, he'll make everything known to you. So he's not saying, pray for all those things. He's saying, look, he'll let you know about all those things. I'm cold. Maybe I need a blanket. And I'm sleeping on the floor with mice. You know, what I really want you to pray for is my boldness so I'll be able to speak the gospel. But Tychicus, he'll let you know all the other details. I've sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren in love with faith. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace, remember, he's chained to a wall, possibly. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Isn't that great? That's wonderful. Well, that's Ephesians, folks. We made it. Thank you.